I like many parts of mine. I enjoy to rewatch them again and again. The biggest success was when I won the first 256 byte in Compo at Ravision. I am very proud of our 1K DOS intros, Chrome Revenge and QB Lab, and the two 504 byte Windows intro, the grid and the whole. I think that's my 256 byte version of Columns because uh, that was my biggest challenge so far to get uh, that one done. It's definitely pulls from 2009. Not because it would be the most technically impressive or the prettiest, but because of the live reaction of the people on the River Wash party where it was released. But also because it introduced more people to size coding than than anything I've ever done before or after that. So maybe it's the product called Killed by 00256. It's kind of James Bond idea behind of that. So maybe James Bond in 256 bytes. As it won second place in revision back in time and was my, let's say, my first trophy. And I'm also quite proud because I never thought I could bring it down from the initial version to the size required. But also I like my product uh, Volumi that won third prize in function because for me winning at least something in function is always like winning something at the world championship, which for me function still is for the 265 byte category. I guess the answer most people would expect is memories, but that's not the case. Actually, I'm most proud of um, having achieved to squeeze the Dragon Fractal into 16 bytes. At the time of speaking, it is 16 bytes. So this is the, most, the, the production I'm most proud of because uh, 16 bytes is really, really tiny and you cannot really come up with something distinctive in, in 16 bytes. And to have a production which uh, runs on every old school computer, every DOS computer with uh, low megahertz and with, uh, with a bad graphics card, so to speak, this is the one I'm most proud of. Lightcrypt mostly because I spent a lot of time on that and also did win revision. I'm really proud of the work that I did on the music for Megademica by Serge Soft. That was something really special to be a part of and I really enjoyed being able to try out some of the ideas I'd had for a while about how to efficiently represent musical ideas in data. So that was, yeah, I think really great to work on and uh, getting the Meteoric no nomination, that says a lot. Um, but as a less obvious choice, I'd have to say um, my 128-byte uh, intro Shiba Dob. I think with a lot of size coding, the it, you get the problem that you've kind of seen the whole thing in about 10 seconds. It's kind of hard to come up with something that has staying power that you can just leave running and it just evolves over time. But I think this is one of the few occasions when it's really had that sort of effect. It's something I'll be happy to, to leave running in the background to, uh, to demo party. The productions I'm most proud of are, for example, Old School is Moving Along. Um, my first uh, 256 byte info on TIG80. Uh, where I got second place at Love by 2021. And I think what was nice there was that I used most part of the code as scroll text um, to have some long and uh, alternating uh, scroll text there and also combine it with other effects and some music even because uh, the new card type had some predefined waveforms where I could just uh, uh, could just play a uh, square wave as kind of melody. And the second intro I'm proud of is Blobs, which was a 4K intro at Mecha Symposium 1998. Uh, it got last placed because I think uh, it was unfinished and uh, didn't look very interesting on the big screen. Um, but it was maybe the first release of some marching cubes uh, metaballs in 4K back then. And uh, I did some uh, triangle rendering with texture mapping uh, and used some environment mapping as kind of shaded uh, surface with some 
uh, specular highlights. And well, the important part here was uh, to get all the tables uh, you needed for marching cubes uh, into the small size. I think there's one work which turned out to be very popular and it's called Tube. But actually, my personal favorite is another demo called Lattice, which came out a couple months later. And the reason is that I felt like it's really pushing the envelope technologically, because uh, today, of course, these techniques are completely mainstream and they have official names like ambient occlusion or sphere tracing of distance fields. But back then, it was still a relatively unexplored area, so being able to do it in just 256 bytes uh, was something that I was really proud of. And uh, even today, I think it doesn't look that bad. Deep Trip. This is, in fact, my second serious prod in which I have invested quite a lot of effort and I think it turned out beautifully. Snake 64. As far as I know, this is a record for the size of snake game. I even have a 35 version, not so beautiful, but quite working. Herba Kaif. <laughs> the prod is interesting from a technical point of view, since it's a demonstration of the floating point byte code recompiler, FPB, I developed. It allows to significantly compress large block of floating point code. I'm the most proud of uh, Water Express, which I did last year, and um, it was the most challenging and uh, I think the best looking one I ever did. And it also took me the most of time from all the intros I ever made. Well, I guess I would have to go with the final 32-bit ARM version of Edge Dancer. The original party version was done in thumb code and I didn't really think that it would be possible to fit this effect in 128 bytes of ARM code. But in the end it just about fit. So yeah, I was kind of proud about that. Uh, my favorite production was a version of Doom Fire that I made for the Apple II and it fits in 64 bytes. And it's really tricky about this. It uses the fact that scrolling text can also scroll the res graphics in the Apple II. What I most like about it is I was working with Cucumber on it, and I think he didn't think I could get it down to 64 bytes, and I managed to. And you know, usually you don't get many bytes past the Cucumber. My least favourite part of size coding is probably getting started, just getting over that initial hurdle when you've just got a blank uh, page of code and you're thinking, right, what am I going to make? Because you need something that's in the sweet spot of uh, achievable but also impressive enough to be worth doing. And at that point you're at the furthest possible place to actually knowing whether that decision has paid off. But uh, I think, yeah, you've just got to choose an idea and then go go for it. Mm. Maybe promoting bad programming habits. Catching bugs is probably the least interesting part of the process for me. It's hunting for bugs. I hate when I have to start the debugger. Like everybody, it's the bug hunting because there's so many weird things happening in those box or free doors that don't fit together or sometimes there is exceptions with the floating point or whatever kind of crap and then you endlessly look for the bug for such a tiny thing. I think FPU coding for complex uh, functions like if you have a let's say a sine distance function with uh, lots of sine, cosine, squares or cubes or like some of these equations or refractions or stuff like that and uh, to to do that on FPU is like a pain in the ass, and more so as I often like often no I I, actually, I think I never prototype in a higher language. 
So just go into the FBU and type your code down there and optimize there and shifting stuff around. That's the real pain. Code golfing, not making it under the size limit and then spending way too much time to actually make it under the size limit. When you're trying and trying and you can't get that last bite off, uh, it can be frustrating, you take days. Um, and uh, especially when it's a hard limit and you just know it just won't work without it. Um, I think running out of registers is something I really hate about size coding. Um, the struggle is real. That's no joke. It's very frustrating when sometimes you simply can't make an effect fit. You have a great idea, you implement it, and yeah, you're just a few bytes over and you try and try to get it down, but it just won't work. That sucks a bit. Uh, when you realize that, okay, you spend so much time playing with this new idea and it's not going anywhere, that, well, you have to drop it. And I, I don't like it, but sometimes it's just worth doing. It's usually when I'm working out compatibility or speed problems, something that doesn't really involve size coding, but it's a part of the process. And I found out I cannot make it fit and I have two days to make something else for a party. The least preferable part of size coding right now are the missing uh, live events where you can show your production in front of a big audience, I think. Oh, I'm sure it's a net benefit to working together with another coder. Well, I think if you decide to do a collaboration at a size coding project, you are very, very sure that this will benefit the whole production. So I think if there would be bigger obstacles, there wouldn't be any collaborations because nobody wants to waste uh, precious time and code. Well, the times I've tried it, it always expanded my mind to see how the other person approaches the problem and the tricks they are trying to apply. can be both. I think you should clearly set the tasks and who uh, yeah, will decide on what. Like with every project in real life, it's good to divide some task and then it can actually work. But of course, if both work totally on the same thing, it would be just a competition who can do it smaller, which maybe not that interesting. I would, of course, go with the net benefit because I work together with uh, quite a few um, coders in my, um, in my life as a size coder and always it has uh, turned out to be uh, another level of quality. And also um, people like these people became um, more of a friend over the time. And also I learned a lot and I can't even describe what's happening there. Just, you know, that you just sit together even remotely and go over an idea or over a passage and just having some word or a comment or something like that can change the whole curse of what you're developing. So it's of course a net benefit. So if you are opting for doing a cooperation with somebody, do it. I think it can be a benefit if you do it for like final polishing or feedback in general. But again, I think size coding is mostly for solo development. I'd say it's hard to think of a situation where working together isn't a benefit. It always amazes me on the Discord when someone posts a piece of code back and forth and just as you think that it's been optimized as far as it possibly can be, it just takes another pair of eyes to go, oh no, you can save this bit here and the whole process starts off again. Maybe a downside might be that the artistic vision gets diluted a bit. That if, for example, like the, the uh, color palette there's another way of doing it that's half the size, but it's not quite as good and it's harder for the original author then to uh, to sort of fight for, no, we should 
keep the longer, better code. But I think that that all feels like a, a bit of a, a theoretical objection, really. I think more collaboration is the way to go. I think this is a form of pack programming, and the advantages of it just outweigh the obstacles. Uh, and it's also a chance to learn from each other. I'm not sure if the question is meant literally, like uh, two people contributing to the same source code, because that would largely depend uh, on the chemistry between the two. But uh, if it's meant like more broadly, like brainstorming or trying to come up with some optimization for an already existing part of code, uh, I think that can be very beneficial, even exciting. Adequate and not arrogant people can't have any obstacles in joint creativity. I believe that synergy always gives only benefits. So there are obvious benefits of it, because uh, you could first test the ideas much quicker, you could uh, probably match, get much better optimized code, because you know the more eyes, the more uh, places to find uh, something to optimize. But also, it can be an obstacle because, well, we are adults and we have limited time and uh, usually people have free time at different uh, periods. So, uh, so synchronizing to work on uh, one production can be a challenge. Uh, also, there can be different motivation of people, so one person can invest more time than the other, and also there can be different opinions. Uh, that uh, So probably the production should still need to have a leader with kind of final decision maker to, to prevent situation where basically artistic or coding vision just go into different directions and people will more argue than cooperate. I would say it's a net benefit. If you have something who can fill in your blind spots, be it missed optimizations or, I don't know, an eye for a better color palette, or maybe just someone to keep going after you said, screw, this is good enough. Yeah, I, th I think it's really beneficial. I think it's a benefit. Uh, it's always good to have someone look over and find the obvious few bites that you missed. And, you know, especially if they can think about a problem in a different way. I have no preferences in this regard. It all depends on the concept of the intro being created. Sometimes the standard palette of the mode, mode 13 hex is quite suitable, and sometimes it's necessary to create a gradient, black and white, or cute rainbow on bloody red. It's logical, right? Mm, I'll have to go with the Sinclair ZX Spectrum palette. Well, the Apple II, you get what is built in, mostly due to NTSC artifacting, and that's about it. Uh, luckily, luckily, it's actually fairly decent, but I, it's always amusing when people compliment me for my palette selections for some of these demos. But uh, and no worries, you get the 15 colors you get, and that's, that's what you get. So on the Spectrum and, I guess, other 8 bits, you don't really get a whole lot of choice about color palette. And on the Tick 80, I was uh, starting to get a bit bored with the uh, options basically being the default rainbow palette or the monochromatic color gradient. So around about the time of Love Bite Battlegrounds last year, I sort of sat down to figure out a nice formula for better palettes where it's sort of the red, green and blue components sort of going out of phase so you get some uh, nice transitions without it being to full on Dutch color scheme. Well, uh, looking at the screenshots of my productions over there at Demosu, I think I like bluish colors for whatever reason. But usually I decide by gut feeling or by trying a few variations to find the one that fits the best. So far I've mostly gone for uh, grayscale or monochrome color palettes, uh, mostly because I like more shades over more colors. 
So I'm working mostly on Atari, uh, Excel, XE, and on this platform we have a very wide palette. So, um, uh, so usually I'm just selecting the colors that are the best for the production I'm working on. I don't have that many limitations there. Of course, I have limitations what can be put together on the screen by the, some system constraints, but uh, I don't have to choose specific palette to work with. For my productions, the best color palette, which has short code and it must have at least two nice gradients. By the way, I wrote an article about color palettes referencing many tiny intros. It's black-white, because if you go black-white, you cannot do anything wrong. Or cleverly selecting um, entries from the default palette, foggy up, VGA palette, because uh, they can be, the outcome can be very pleasing results just from cleverly selecting these colors and you would like save the code for defining a palette. The best color palettes are those with smooth gradients, I think. I usually use two kinds of palettes. The first kind is a series of single color gradients, and it's, this is best used for effects that are smooth and need to hide color gradations. And the second time is something I call a dual tone palette, and this is just a two-channel uh, two palette where the channels can be combined in an arbitrary way. And these are really good for noisy effects where you can hide the small number of steps. Well, that's really simple. If you have the bytes left, you would always create a nice palette for the 265 color productions. If not, of course, you have to stick with the standard VGA palette. But in general, I always or often did this in the past that I tried to go for true color products, but what you maybe know, if you also know like shader coding a bit, those final coloring things for true color would consume and are consuming a lot of code. So it's quite hard to get true color things right for tiny intros. But of course, then it just looks nice. <laughs> Oh, it's almost too big. You can almost fit a full-size demo in it. Uh, I know it's more commonly for a boot sector. The Apple II boot sector is only 256 bytes, but um, doesn't mean I won't try coding one though. Boot sector intros. I mean, why not? But then again, it's just another old arbitrary limit from the old days. Too large. It's simply too large. I don't know how to spend 512 bytes for something. At least if we're talking about RS-DOS. Um, considering that in uh, working with 256 bytes it can take dozens of hours to create an intro, then for in 212 bytes it could take more than 100 hours to, to do something, and uh, something like for, for winning entry. And uh, personally I don't have that much time for, to, to, to spend on one intro to work with. Uh, well, my first D was a 512 byte intro, which will always be some kind of dark cloud over my head. Uh, that should be enough of an answer. Actually, it would be maybe the holy grail to have a 265 byte visual plus 265 byte great music or sound, but I think almost nobody does it because maybe everybody thinks it's too big and it, maybe people would think it could be done in 265 bytes, including the sound, but nah. actually I don't know why nobody's picking it up. I think that it's the first category where you can put some compressed data into your intro and finally make something that relates to the real world and it's not just a depiction of something abstract. So I would really like to try to do something in that size. In 256 bytes, you cannot make great music and games visual at the same time. 
In 500 terabyte category, this is possible. The problem is that size needs more effort. And another important possibility for this category is clearly the Windows Tiny intros. If you go for a high resolution or you switch uh, platforms, for example, to Windows or to, to Linux, and, uh, and go for some kind of procedural sound generation, uh, then I think there's pretty awesome stuff possible. Even even on Windows, where you are kind of restricted to the header, I think Tomcat uh, did, what is the name for it? The Grid or something? It's this ray traced bowl, um, and it looks really great. So if he takes this as a benchmark and as an um, inspiration, then I would say there's this is a very promising category. It just requires a lot of work for a normal size coin. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in the 512 byte category. I think it's the sort of size limit where you can start making creative decisions for their own sake rather than being railroaded into what the size limit wants you to do. If you've got a particular colour scheme or texture or musical melody that you want to have in, in your intro, then you can really do that rather than being forced to go for maybe something that's 90% as good, but half the size. I think the 512 byte category is a nice place to do something more traditional in demo and intro coding while still being an, on a strong size limit for this kind of stuff. So you can still put something interesting into it and also have a lot of platforms where you can do something, even Windows. Well, personally, I'm glad that it was introduced because uh, I feel like we've been stuck with DOS and the same old VJ mode for a bit too long. So I think that uh, this category is uh, where things might be pushed further technologically. Maybe we'll get to see some new types of effects or maybe we'll get to see stuff uh, on modern operating systems. Oh, it's a cool category, which lacks attention from many party organizers. Where I use it to 256 byte intros as a kind of a standard. However, 512 bytes allow you to make more complex and nice effects high resolution, faster algorithms, proper sound or music. There was a question about concepts in intros. So in the 512 byte category, it's easy to implement an interesting concept rather than just a repetitive effect. So orgs who add 512 byte categories like Super, Ro Super Rogue and his team are going it right. And I hope the Cafe Party Orgs will not forget about this category too. Simple answer number three, uh, why not? I've always felt like modern programming is wasteful, and this is going back years when, you know, Megabyte felt wasteful. And so, uh, uh, just because I'm old, you know, in the old days, you know, it was important to get things to fit, and, you know, why be wasteful if you don't have to be? There is no excitement without limits. You can of course make some incredibly complex and or usually effect and cause a wow effect in audience, but making it under restrictions is cooler, isn't it? The expectations uh, towards a demo or even an intro nowadays are really, really high. Like if you see these productions, these are movies, so you have to be a uh, uh, director, you have to be a producer, you have to, you know, like you have to have a storyboard and just, you know, if you focus 
on the effects and on the sounds on a small narrative, then you have the chance to actually produce something uh, which is good. And otherwise, you just you just don't. Like if you just start coding and you have no limits, then something comes along, and something is not good enough in the demo scene anymore. Mm, I don't know if you imagine an athlete or a high jumper, for instance. If he sets the bar higher, he's also, in a way, limiting his options for a successful jump. But uh, at the same time, this is what makes him better, right? So this is how I look at it. And uh, many of us are also working on other projects. So it's not like we only have to do size coding and nothing else. So I think we are not really limiting ourselves. This is just something we do for fun. Um, applying a limit or some other form of restriction to a problem uh, makes it more interesting for some people and uh, also adds some new form of fun because you can solve something uh, which wouldn't be any interesting thing without limit. In a word, I think it's all about escapism. It's in real world programming, most of the time, well, we, we've got all of this processing power and storage space and the bottleneck is programmer time. So it makes no economic sense to relentlessly optimize things to these levels. So I think what size coding really gives you is this sort of uh, what if scenario? What if this is actually mattered to optimize things to this extent? I think it's simplicity and focus. You don't need many tools. You just stare at that one page of code and all the problems and solutions are right there. In a lot of circumstances, not only size coding, also in your private hobby, whatever life, uh, limiting size or money or time or whatever and uh, limiting to every few pieces of whatever it really makes you more creative than having everything possible that is doable it's just too much choice i don't know the psychology about it but too much choice i think makes you go crazy and not going anywhere so it, with size coding you can really focus on something. I really enjoy deep dives into a single production where I can learn what troubles have the authors overcome and what tricks have they tried that, but uh, didn't work. Well, I like challenges and I think size coding is, uh, is a serious challenge and um, uh, with restrictions, uh, restrictions boost creativity. I don't like waste. I like to make better code. I like optimize my product. The size limit is a good challenge, good game and good fun. Everything you need to know about DOS size coding. No idea how long that seminar would take. I would like to have covered the topic of some uh, math to create some uh, interesting visual effects. Um, I didn't read any books on this topic. I believe there can be, or somebody can be interested, can be um, really good on, on doing those things. So maybe kind of review of um, possible techniques and something new or some fear behind it, because usually it's about well-known techniques, but I'm not sure if people spend much time on, on the theory behind it. And there is some very nice theory of, you know, cellular automators and why they work and why why they bring uh, those chaotic behaviors. So so this type of seminar will be very interesting for me. Uh, I'd be interested in seeing more uh, obscure machines um, maybe discussed. 
I have absolutely no clue whatsoever. Sound synthesis, musical instruments, natural phenomena, perhaps even voice, 3D, ray marching, ray tracing. Uh, where do ideas come from? More behind the scenes seminars would be great. Speaking about the making of the best tiny intros. Case studies by the authors. Well, I don't think like uh, I have a particular preference, but uh, maybe it would be interesting to let selected authors do something like uh, post-mortem analysis of their work where they would explain the approach, uh, maybe mention the problems which they faced, also how their ideas evolved. Uh, I think something like that could be interesting. In general, I, I think it's important to, to have these, to have a lower entry barrier to, to make it more possible for people to, to join our size coding uh, domain. Uh, and for myself, what would I like to have covered in this high schooling seminar? I think sound production. I, I think sound and like directly like PCM and uh, how do you produce a bass line? How do you do the um, deep house bass line? How do you, how do you um, construct an organ? I think uh, audio or music is an interesting topic which should be covered by a seminar. I think actually also like the audio thing because I'm not too much into audio or synthy basics like what can you actually implement even in such tiny intros of real world synthy physics modeling whatsoever. Whatsoever. I think Puet's all-time top 10 for the various categories and platforms was quite accurate and a good start. Probably I wouldn't go with uh, 256 bytes and less, because size coding is also about the doing things in 1 kilobyte or 4 kilobytes. And um, if we think about those categories, there is a lot of uh, very impressive things uh, using um, GPU uh, that uh, can be very very uh, impressive for even non-coders or people just out of the demo scene and uh, i would probably start with those sizes i think there are plenty of good examples so for instance uh, pools or light crypt or memories just to show what's possible and where the bar is set now uh, i think helmut's memories is a good intro i think that's even if people don't have a feel for uh, what you can do on a tiny amount of code, it does an amazing amount of stuff for the amount of space it takes. Obvious uh, answer people would expect is like my own memories, but that's not the case because um, that's just very many tiny little effects. I think I would go for, for two intros. The first one is uh, Pirit from Rola because it's just so shiny. It's just, you know, it's um, it's just so good looking. It's just one object, but a complicated one. and has reflections and all that stuff. And uh, the, the color palette is uh, really good looking. So this is the first one uh, because it's just so shiny and good looking as a high quality. And the second one would be a mega pole from, from Board Surfer. Um, all, all things aside about his personality, this shows that you can uh, get a complex um, geometric scene across with a good perception of depth and even a bit of camera movement. I guess I would show him maybe about Surfer's mega pole because it looks like a sci-fi movie, low-res scene. Even some small spaceships 
flying through the streets, so maybe that one that could create some interested people in showing them you can create some small city even with 265 bytes that is even animated. Well, for this I would choose something less abstract and more realistic, uh, like for example Relax by Roller. Um, for non seniors I'd say IND by IND. And for non size coders, I go with the Light Crypt by Alcatraz. Chrome Revenge would be the first on my list, and Memories too. But there are so many great examples, I couldn't stop showing them. There are a lot of cool intros. Pools, Spirit, Geroid, Seraph, Symmetry by Rolla, and Light Crypt by Gopher, and Everbloom Memories by Helmut. An intro is a very long title taken from a song by Kumel for Arm with a Beautiful Kaleidoscope. A Mediate Railways Speed Runner. 2048 by Digimind and Megapool home base by Thread Sector, Sector Inc. and many many others. <laughs>